In September 1941, Eric received the long-awaited word that his third daughter, Maureen, had been born in Toronto. He cabled back, wonderful news, love, Eric. As the Japanese army gradually tightened the restrictions on the foreign residents in North China, Eric and his colleagues were kept from all contact with the Chinese people. With their missionary work of teaching and preaching curtailed, it was up to each person to find meaningful activity. For many weeks, Eric worked to complete a manual on Christian discipleship for Chinese believers. In it, he wrote, Victory over all the circumstances of life comes not by might nor by power, but by a practical confidence in God and by allowing His Spirit to dwell in our hearts and control our actions and emotions. Learn in the days of ease and comfort, so that when the days of hardship come, you will be fully prepared and equipped to meet them. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Things changed dramatically as far as the Japanese were concerned on the 8th of December, 1941, when in fact we woke up with a machine gun pointing at the front doors and an entire Japanese army that was surrounding you. For the next year, Eric and his fellow enemy nationals were free to move about the British concession in Tianjin, but could not leave the city. Some letters got through, but only after censorship and long delays. And each day brought new uncertainties and the rumors spawned by wartime. During the summer of 1942, it appeared that some British citizens might be able to leave China, but Eric was not among them. And early in 43, the Japanese government announced that all enemy nationals in North China would be relocated to civilian assembly centers, a polite name for prison camps. For Eric, the final chapter of his life would be written with 1,500 other people in a place called Weishen. In his manual on discipleship, Eric included this prayer. Father, I pray that no circumstances, however bitter or however long drawn out, may cause me to break thy law, the law of love to thee and to my neighbor, that I may not become resentful, have hurt feelings, hate, or become embittered by life's experiences, but that in and through all, I may see thy guiding hand and have a heart full of gratitude for thy daily mercy, daily love, daily power, and daily presence. Help me in the day when I need it most to remember that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. I can do all things through him that strengtheneth me. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. One of the internees penned these words, Wei Shen, the test. Whether a man's happiness depends on what he has or what he is, on outer circumstances or inner heart, on life's experiences, good and bad, or on what he makes out of the materials those experiences provide. I was nine when I went into camp, and it's quite interesting, actually, because I can always recall being herded together in the old British Army barracks and being made to walk along the road to the station. On March 27, 1944, Eric wrote to Florence, you seem very near today. It is the 10th anniversary of our wedding. Happy, loving remembrances. We must celebrate it together next year. Eric taught science in the camp school, along with organizing sports and games. Many of the children and teenagers in Wei Shen were from the China Inland Mission School at Chifu, and Eric gave himself to them without reserve. Beyond his official duties, he tutored several students in science. He had a degree in chemistry, and so somebody asked him if he would teach. There were three of us the same age, the same class, 
and he took all wanting to do science. And so he taught us chemistry. But we had no textbooks at all, uh, so he wrote his own textbook from memory. And he had written this little book, uh, and in the front he wrote, The Bones of Inorganic Chemistry. Can these dry bones live? He had written. <laughs> and uh, then he wrote the laws and he wrote the experiments. So he would say, you know, I'm putting this mixture into this and I'm heating it over a Bunsen burner. What will happen? And then I had to know <laughs> the answer. So we did all the chemistry experiments without any equipment at all. You couldn't buy a Christmas card, obviously, so you had to make your own. And he was ingenious, and he provided me with a fun Christmas card showing uh, some chemical reaction taking place. And it was from him, and uh, it was fun, and it made chemistry fun. He was a really good teacher, but he had a heart, he cared. Well, the first thing he was doing was, was organizing us in sports activities and, and getting us all on the sports field to play. So that was the beginning. Then he also had Bible classes that we were invited to. And that was always very inspiring. And he, he, he had a special burden for teenagers. And uh, he was really concerned about teenagers, and especially those of us who were griping about why we were in prison instead of in college, you know. <laughs> I attended two series of meetings that he took in the church at the camp. And one was on St. Paul's Hymn of Love, 1 Corinthians 13, which he went through very slowly and carefully. And then on another occasion, he took the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7. And again, he took us through it and applied it to everyday life in a very simple and effective way. And his personal life seemed to bear out everything he was saying in both these series of addresses he gave. As the war dragged on, Eric's brief letters to Florence were to reassure her, more than anything else, that he was alive and well. On October 25th, 1944, Eric wrote to her, glorious weather, winter activities begin. Good start, teaching, winter games, children's evening clubs, religious services. Kept busy, remembering you all. Special love for special occasions, Eric. But everything was not well. It was about that time that I began to take note of Eric and realize that he was slower in his movements, in conversation, he was, there was much less repartee. Uh, he was beginning to think hard before he replied. And he was complaining uh, about December. He began to complain of very severe headaches. And uh, that was the beginning of, uh, of his major problem, which of course is a brain tumor. The Salvation Army Band, where I played the trumpet in those days, uh, the Salvation Army Band uh, played outside twice a week, midweek and on a Sunday. Eric Little was in hospital and was obviously seriously ill. And we came to the grounds outside the hospital and we were playing some of the usual hymns with patients inside. And the nurse sent out a message on a piece of paper, Eric Little is dying. He would like you to play Finlandia. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on, when we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgot, love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past, all safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. And we played it, and it was a matter of a few days later that Eric Little died. I, I felt just desolate. I just felt, I just felt, you know, why? 
why would God take him? And it, ju it just felt like the, 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 the light had gone out of the whole camp. Grown men who under other circumstances would, wouldn't be seen to be shedding a tear were in fact uh, weeping openly. I remember us as teenagers just talking, you know, why did, why did God permit that, you know? Why would he go before he had a chance to get back to his family? And... We missed him, we missed his example. It was his living out the Sermon on the Mount in his daily life that really uh, has left a deep impression on me. And my impression of him was that that was the last thing he ever thought about, was whether anybody thought Eric Little was marvellous. That he just loved God and loved serving him, loved people, and was delighted if he could do something useful. And if Eric Little was forgotten, that wouldn't worry him at all. His speeches weren't the most important. The most important was his personal touch with people who were wounded. And many of them were the Chifu kids away from their parents. I, I used to think, oh, Daddy, why aren't you here with us? Why don't you here with us? It wasn't until years later, years later, that I met some people, children, there were children in the camp, and um, I realized what he had done for them. We loved him. He ran well. <laughs> he ran well right up to his death. He ran well. Amazing. Yeah.